Major asset managers Morrison and Macquarie are obsessed with investing in infrastructure. Why they still see trillion dollar opportunities for investors. I think the obsession will continue. Yeah, the amount of capital that's behind that is, is incredible, but the ability for governments to generate that sort of capital and have that um, you know, invested with the public purse is, is really difficult. It's Friday the 22nd of March and you're watching Markets with Madison. Infrastructure is all the rage right now, with asset managers building wind and solar farms and owning stakes in airports and utilities. The biggest deals here recently have been the sale of telco cell towers for prices in the billions. But I'm told that's just the start, because governments globally can't afford to fix ageing infrastructure after blowing out their balance sheets. It's being dubbed the age of infrastructure investing. The amount of capital raised by the top 100 players tipped over 1 trillion US dollars in 2023, according to the infrastructure investor. The biggest players are Australia's Macquarie Asset Management, Canada's Brookfield, Sweden's EQT, New York's KKR, and Global Infrastructure Partners, which was just acquired by BlackRock in a deal worth 3 billion US dollars. As populations grow and we transition to more electric vehicles, rely on more renewable energy and store more data in the cloud, the demand for more critical infrastructure is enormous. JP Morgan and McKinsey believe another three and a half trillion US dollars of capital is needed every year. Governments can't afford it alone. That's the so-called funding gap these firms talk about. Morrison & Co is one of them. It's been investing in infrastructure globally for the past 30 years. In airports, transmission lines, fibre internet networks, water and telecommunication sites. It started Infratil, the NZX listed company that bought One New Zealand, Wellington's airport and has wind farms and data centres in Australia. But Tim Skirman from Morrison sees more opportunity, especially globally. Existing infrastructure is ageing, and Western governments are struggling to pay for new builds, especially after costly pandemic policies. Skirman says that's where investors can get in. Hey Tim, thanks so much for coming on the show, I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Firstly, how much has Morrison & Co invested in infrastructure over its 30-year lifetime? Well, so uh, today we manage around about $38 billion uh, New Zealand dollars globally. Um, and that's from a starting point uh, way back in 1994 with Infratil being founded and, and listed on the New Zealand exchange. It's been quite a journey. Is that money that's invested just in New Zealand via Infratil or is that globally across all of Morrison? No, that is money that uh, sourced from investors globally, largely in Australia and New Zealand and increasingly internationally. And it's invested into assets uh, that are both local in Australia and New Zealand, but also uh, international as well. If we look globally, Morrison is just one of many infrastructure investment managers. And it seems to me like there is, at least now, quite an institutional obsession with investing in infrastructure. What do you think are the factors that have influenced the attraction to infrastructure as an asset class? Yeah, well, that's quite a broad question. Um, and it is it's a big need for infrastructure capital. So it's a big market, it's a big market opportunity. Uh, and so we're seeing these names and this interest come from the institutional uh, world. You know, for, for an institutional investor, it's a very long duration, duration asset as well. So uh, you're finding a nice match between their profile of what they're trying to deliver uh, and the uh, the nature of what uh, an infrastructure asset will uh, uh, will provide to them. But the amount of capital that's required to uh, to deliver what we're demanding of the society in terms of energy transition, in terms of our use of digital, uh, you know. Um, uh, the consumption of data and all the infrastructure that's required to support that is huge and it's changing and we need to evolve with it. So, um, you know, the amount of capital that's behind that is is incredible. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, large asset management names uh, you know, interested in stepping into the space recently with a couple of transactions. Um, and that's sort of a testament to the fact that this is actually a really interesting asset class to invest in long term, you know, driven by those long term trends. But actually, the, uh, the the size and scale of it is tremendous. The ability to do impact in terms of the way that we uh, we're supporting our society as well uh, is really well aligned with those institutional interests. 
It seems like every firm has a figure on this, so I'm wondering and hoping that Morrison does too. But the actual total size of the potential addressable market, or perhaps the potential funding gap that needs to be filled in infrastructure. So, so it's really difficult um, to quantify. It's in the trillions, uh, and you know, you, you, we get external references from world banks and you know large organisations that try to quantify that. Um, I think it's actually really difficult, and it almost gets lost in the amount. Uh, of that, what's really important is um, how is that coming to market? What's the role of private capital in supporting that? Um, you know, in some instances, it's very much a state-backed uh, you know, delivery of infrastructure to support society. Um, in many countries, they're looking to private capital to really evolve that front line and play a, a meaningful role in bringing new forms of infrastructure, as well as helping the public balance sheets as well. Yeah, because bottom line, governments can't afford to do all of this on their own, can they? And I guess especially now, after the pandemic, and how much that cost economies too, right? That's 100% uh, correct. We're seeing a really important role for governments to be um, to be sponsoring this and supporting it. Uh, we're seeing that particularly with energy transition. Uh, but the ability for governments to generate that sort of capital and have that um, you know, invested with the public purse is, is really difficult. We're seeing a lot of circumstances where, um, sadly, infrastructure is ageing and it's not even being maintained effectively. So bringing that uh, you know, into private control uh, with the right governance and with the right uh, support is really critical to delivering that uh, outcome that we need as a society. You mentioned that this is a very interesting asset class to be in, but I guess it's also quite easy as well, right? Because these are tangible things, bridges, railroads, things that people, and especially investors, can quite easily wrap their heads around. It's all critical infrastructure that we understand the need of daily. But how does a firm like yours actually earn a return on these assets? It, it's easy to quantify it like that. Actually, it's quite a complex set of real assets uh, to be engaged in, and some of that change factor is adding complexity as well. We're demanding different things. We have technology that's enabling different things to happen. So. Uh, so how do we look at that from a return perspective? Uh, we certainly seek to have a return, um, you know, commensurate with the risk involved with those assets. Uh, but one of the things that we've been quite successful at Morrison's over time is looking at how do we invest in good businesses with good growth uh, options in front of them. So finding those long-term tailwind sort of supportive uh, of the infrastructure assets that are in the right place and provide that optionality for growth into the future and backing the right management teams, be it us through our direct ownership of those assets or what we do uh, in a listed market uh, investment context. That's really key to, to the return profile. And what's the sort of mechanism that you're doing that by? Is it by buying into or taking over or investing into other companies or is it actually funding the builds of such infrastructure? So um, you've seen Infratil uh, perhaps is a really good example. Uh, of where we acquire businesses with a lot of growth optionality uh, within them. And then in that case, it's both ownership, but it's also using the Morrison capability uh, to make sensible decisions about um, you know, growing those businesses and providing capital to them uh, appropriately. Uh, we also are active in the listed markets where we are you know, working with the liquid security. So we've got to position ourselves in our portfolios uh, with companies who will uh, make those right return uh, you know, decisions, um, both in terms of existing projects and where that value might um, uh, present itself from just the existing assets, but also that growth profile of, of where they're well positioned to capture those opportunities in the future. I guess the tricky thing now is, and you've even spoken about it, you know, how many other investment firms are now playing in this multi-trillion dollar infrastructure space? Is that now making it harder to access deals to be able to invest in these companies and in these builds? Yeah, look, at, as I said earlier, it's a massive uh, opportunity. Um, uh, Morrison uh, has a, a proud New Zealand uh, firm uh, you know, with, a, with a huge track record of having grown that internationally. Uh, we're a specialist in infrastructure, so we target those opportunities where um, we find it attractive to be investing in ideas that matter with a good return profile, uh, you know, the right sustainability aspects that we look for in that as well. We think there's a wide open playing field there. We don't, uh, uh, we don't see a lot of that um, you know, competitive nature slowing down uh, that demand profile for these assets and the opportunities that we're looking at.
So even though more firms are increasingly playing in this space, there is enough of a funding gap that allows room for everyone, really. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, that's certainly the case, but certainly as a specialist, where you know you're a firm that um, of roughly 200 people that uh, globally seven offices, we just focus on um, on infrastructure. Uh, that to us is is our niche. That's where we like to play. So, um, you know, certainly the opportunity is is diverse and wide. Um, but you know, we're finding that access uh, to deals and the pipeline of deals that are in progress has certainly not slowed down. You mentioned there Morrison's motto, which is investing in those ideas that really matter. But what are the thematics and the evidence around them that's giving you high conviction to invest in those ideas that matter to Morrison? So, great question. It's a, um, very, very much a, uh, a sort of a purpose statement for us. Uh, we're looking at those thematics which allow us to invest in you know, what are those ideas that matter. Things like decarbonisation and the energy transition, as everybody's looking towards net zero and those targets, how do we evolve that? Uh, that's that's across um, energy generation, thinking about investment as, as New Zealand has been a leader in for, uh, for decades, right? Um, uh, development of wind farms, uh, solar. But we're, we're now seeing that build across energy networks um, and right through to the emerging technologies, which are going to enable things like batteries and, and uh, so forth into the future. So it's a really exciting journey to be on. Uh, the, the data growth that's fueling digitization, and we've seen so much about AI uh, come through in the, in the last six months that um, it really is providing another leg of excitement um, around that and a deeper understanding of the sort of infrastructure that is required to uh, to support that. But we're seeing it right across existing infrastructure as well. Um, you know, how do we manage toll roads, airports, seaports? Uh, it's it's all changing and emerging um, as we see new technology coming in um, and new demands as well as we think about sustainability objectives in those sectors. The risk here, though, or at least what seems to me to be the largest risk in investing in infrastructure, is governments and the rules and regulations that surround a lot of this type of infrastructure, whether it's sort of this transition to electric vehicles and the policies pushing that, or profit caps on what utilities are allowed to make. That's all in the hands of government. What's yours and Morrison's assessment of that risk? And can you manage it in any way? Um, so certainly by the choice of where you're investing, you can manage that. And uh, in seeking supportive regulatory environments is, is a key uh, risk factor uh, for your investments. Um, but I think, look, there are assets where governments play a really important role. Wellington Airport's a, uh, a great example of that, where uh, government ownership plays a large role in how the airport is, is run as well. Uh, we see that across other assets where um, it, we'd like to have government involvement or we seek out particular support mechanisms. Uh, you know, the development of re- renewable energy is um, a really interesting case in point. In Europe, we're seeing uh, the war in, in the Ukraine um, transfer into higher power prices. Those are now coming off over the over the winter. Um, but we're seeing a ramp up of desire for energy security of supply uh, and the support mechanisms to continue that energy transition journey. So certainly we can see supportive action of governments uh, for that as well. The upshot, though, I guess, is that a lot of these investments are monopolies, aren't they? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, that's the role of, of regulation is to ensure that yeah, abnormal returns are, are regulated uh, to ensure a fair return on investment uh, over time. So uh, we certainly seek out in infrastructure for those uh, characteristics were attractive, be it contracts or um, you know, pricing profile that allows control of that return. And you know, part of our investment assessment is um, you know, will that investment return be delivered uh, over a period of time? So it's a two-way street. When we talk about abnormal profits, also you're entitled to, to a fair return on on your equity investment as well. Fair to say the obsession will continue then, Tim. I think the obsession will continue, yeah. And, you know, it's very much a through-the-cycle investment class and it's driven by what you and I and the rest of society want, right? So if we say we want it, it turns up in demand and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get that supporting infrastructure in place. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Morrison is kind of like McKinsey in a way because they're quite secretive and don't talk much. But Tim was inclined to speak to me for this episode because it's just launched a new infrastructure fund for wholesale investors. I'm not pushing it, but I do want to let you know that it's interesting because this is the company that already owns Infratil in New Zealand. 
But Tim told me that this new fund is quite different. While Infratil invests in private assets down under, this fund will invest in public infrastructure assets globally, with a focus on Europe and North America especially. I find infrastructure very interesting, so please let me know if you want more updates on this asset class. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.